Everyone knew going in that 2018 would be a big year for current events in Ontario. After all, it was an election year, but it was unprecedented for so many reasons. From the resignation of PC Party leader Patrick Brown in January, to the choice of a new leader, Doug Ford, two months later, to the thrashing of the Liberals in the June election, and then the new Tory government hitting the ground running, it's never really let up. Mind you, we're not complaining. Lots to cover. And here to recall the whirlwind, some of the agenda team that make it happen. Host and producer, Nam Kiwanuka. Producer, Meredith Martin. Producer, Eric Bombacino. Producer and host of TVO's podcast, On Docs, Colin Ellis. Producer, Kara Stern. And producer, Harrison Lohman. I have no idea how this segment is going to go, but I'm, I think, delighted to welcome you all to this very official table. We obviously hang out upstairs together when we actually, you know, work on putting this show together. This is all very bizarre right now, but yeah. I think we'll get through the next little while. Let's not assume, Meredith, you've got seniority here, so let's start with you. Let's not assume that everybody knows what a television producer does to get a program on the air. So let's start there. What do you do? I research ideas, I pitch the ideas at our editorial meeting, I then research them further, I read the research, I give what's relevant to you and to Nam, depending on who's hosting, I book the guests, and then I'm in your ear if necessary during the taping. Way too much if you ask me, but that, no, you're uh, just <laughs> wonderful, just wonderful. And um, what is, the, what would you say is the best part of the job? Besides working with Nam and me. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> learning new things all the time. Yeah, isn't that great? I agree. It's the best. I agree. Yeah, Karen, what's the best part of it? You get to what? We get to nerd out for a living. Right on. Yeah. Right on. How about for you? Yeah, I think there's so many times where I just want to learn something about a new topic or I'll think, oh, I wonder about this. And then I get as part of my job to just research it and call up the experts and say, hey, can you tell me more about that? It's, it's really wonderful. Colin, best part of the job? I like meeting the guests. I like meeting them in person. I mean, sometimes we have them on the line, which is fine, but you get to talk to them on the phone most of the time. Uh, but getting them into the green room and having a little chat beforehand uh, and learning more about the topic that you're researching is always like my favorite part. You do learn, meet some fabulous people doing you this do. work, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Harrison, for you? Same sort of thing. Like you get to focus on a wide array of topics, mm -hmm. so you get to become sort of an kind of an expert in a variety of fields as opposed to having to constantly be focusing on one thing. Hmm. Well, one of the reasons we thought it would be kind of cool to get you all together here is to go through some of the highlights and frankly some lowlights of the past year. And I want to start with you, Eric, yeah, yeah. who obviously did not get the memo about what to wear today. <laughs> and this is one of my very best sweaters. I want to okay. say that. Okay. You had something happen during one of your segments this right. year that frankly I think has only had happened once or twice in the 25 years I've spent at TVO. You want to remind everybody? Yeah, it was a first for me as a producer. We're about eight minutes into an interview. We had built a panel around this wonderful book. We had the author on, he was in New York City, eight minutes in, gets up, pulls his mic off, walks out, slams the door. He walked off the set. Walked off the set in the middle of the interview. Uh, and eight minutes later, he made a triumphant return. Well, now let's tell that story, because yeah. he, he obviously was, he was offended by something that one of the other guests said. He thought the other guest was criticizing him too much, and so he got up and left. What did you do at that moment? Okay, so let's set this up a bit. So the book was- I thought was, I just did that. The, the, <laughs> the book was on billionaire philanthropy. So it was, a, it was a criticism of billionaire philanthropy in the sense that billionaires are the cause of the very problems they're trying to solve in philanthropy. So we had him next to the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, which is like the OG of billionaire philanthropists. The OG? The OG. What uh, does that mean? Original gangster. <laughs> the originator of billionaire You're going to need to run subtitles on this whole panel. Right. OK, here we go. And he interrupted him. I mean, you guys can watch it, uh, watch it on air, and I'll, we can tell you about where to find it. But he interrupted him. He did not like that, and he walked out. And so I got him on the phone, and I very pleasantly told him that uh, we've built this whole show around you. So one part of the job of a producer is we don't just sort of let the guests come in here and kind of roll with the discussion. We try to plan it out. We, we do chapters. We structure it. And I built this entire show around this guy's book. Uh, every single chapter was, hey, you said this really interesting thing. Everyone debate this. And he left eight minutes in. So I got him on the phone and told him that if you leave, we're kind of, we don't have a show here. I mean, I didn't use those words. Um, <laughs> you and, uh, but basically, and we, we'd be tap dancing for 30 minutes if he stayed off. And it was going to air that night. So uh, the panic was uh, probably pretty high at that moment. What but when he, he came back, I, I told him that 
I told him that you're screwing me. If you... <laughs> <laughs> because Is that he the was. Word you no, no. Uh, I think he did. I think he used a harsher word, actually. And I said it very kindly yeah. and with respect. Um, <laughs> and that we really need you to come back because we were doing. Why don't we we're name doing... the person who we're talking about? I mean, if people are going to watch it, right? It, it, we could do that. It was Anon Gerdardas? It was. Yeah. Yes. Who's the yes. author of this book? And the book was uh, Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. Right and it's a great book. I mean, I highly recommend it. What's wild is that the author created a GIF of him walking off the set afterwards and then he posted it? it to his social yeah. media right. accounts. Huh. So I don't know. You can look, wonder he what was, intent was He was there, kind but. of, I think, proud of walking off a little bit. And then well, I, you know. that was the vibe I got from the well, social after. I got you, you were my OG that day because yeah. somehow... What does that stand for again? Originally, Originally yeah. Yeah. You, you You're not using sure it properly. You, you talked him back. That. No, I can't. I definitely can't. But you talked him back into the chair and you saved the show, so well done. It was, was a disaster good. that turned into some pretty compelling television. Yeah, it was okay. Okay, let's... Uh, okay. I get the next question I have here on my sheet is to ask what I know to be a fact, which is... Uh, wide shot, please, Mr. Director. You all like her better, right? <laughs> that is... She is easier to work with than I am. Right? Yeah, no. Not true. No. Yeah, they're all nodding. We okay. Like it's very, yeah. Let's just check it's that out. It's not a competition. I know, it's not a competition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Colin Ellis, going to you next. Cool. <laughs> you are a bit different from everybody else here in as much as not only have you been producing pr uh, segments for the agenda this past year, but you got your own podcast. That's right. On Docs. Yeah. So I wonder how that has complicated your life over the past 12 months. <laughs> Uh, it hasn't complicated it that much because I have a really great team uh, helping me produce on Doc, Chantal Berganza, Matthew O'Mara, and our podcast manager, Hannah Song. A lot of people in the building who do a tremendous job. Uh, so I get to kind of just have fun and, and talk to really interesting filmmakers about their documentaries. And you're somehow able to juggle it all? I, I managed to do it, you know? I mean, uh, I've been producing one-on-ones mostly this, uh, this fall. Uh, did one panel. Uh, and then, yeah, the other, the rest of the time I've spent like watching a lot of documentaries and then getting to interview the filmmakers behind them. It's, um, it, it hasn't been as like stressful as I thought it would be. Uh, and I think, again, that's just due to the team that I'm working with. Um, but I definitely have an appreciation for the role you and Nam both have, uh, you know, on air because it's, it's, it's a lot different, right? Like you kind of have to make sure you're not stumbling over your words. Um, and I've done a lot of improv classes to help me uh, train for this. And I've talked to uh, both of you about, you know, what, what you need to do to interview someone on air. Uh, so it's all helped. This is I nice. He, yeah. I think he's done he's, a really good job. He has Thank a little you. more respect for us now, too, exactly. though, which is not too bad. I always yeah. had respect for you. <laughs> no, but Colin has that voice, right? That yeah, kinda, really like, nice voice. That baritone voice. Thank you. Just kind of like... Don't sit there. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you, yeah. yeah. Bit of an NPR voice there. Yeah. Oh, right. thank yeah. you. I'm not quite Terry Gross yet, but... <laughs> Working on hopefully it. Get From W-H-Y-Y in Philadelphia. Yeah, I like her, too. She's great. Well, let's go, Kara. I'm going to get you in at this point, because when we were preparing programs a year ago at this time we would have had no clue that what we were about to embark on was a year of massive political upheaval in Ontario. You remember where we were a year ago? Yeah, having a surprise PC leadership debate, that was a lot of fun to do. Um, it, was, it was really hectic, I guess, having so many, I guess it was just put together so quickly. We had a guest added at the last minute, Tonic Granick Allen. That morning they were saying, oh, I don't, don't think she's gonna be there. Well, it was there. gonna be Doug Ford, Christine Elliott, Caroline Mulrooney, and then the question was, was Tanya Granick allen this fourth place candidate who just sort of jumped in at the last minute, Yeah, I remember we prepared join? for both uh, um, possibilities. We had questions, assuming it was both three or four guests, and we prepared the set in case it was three or four guests, um, and then it turned out to be four. And it was so much fun. It was my first time doing a live uh, debate like that. That had It had got a ton of, of feedback online. Um, so many people were watching it even during the day. It was, it was just like such an incredible, the buzz here, it's like such a great <laughs> feeling when it's that kind of live atmosphere. I mm -hmm. loved it. And of course, that was the setup to the eventual PC Leadership Convention, which our good friend Mr. Harrison Lohman here uh, produced, which was, where was that in? Markham? Or Markham. Something? Yeah, it was in Markham. Hilton. Markham. And, and it was a marathon. It was. How long were we on for? I have the number, Steve. We were on for five hours, <laughs> 56 <laughs> minutes, and 53 seconds. We had almost 30 guests. We were sending people out scrambling uh, into the back rooms trying to grab Tories that we could basically throw on camera and talk to for a few minutes. Uh, you, I don't think you ate the entire time. I remember ha trying to hand you Triscuits with cheese on it just out of the shot. You also, I don't think, did go, you didn't go to the washroom. And I, do you know what they called you online, Steve? I'm afraid to ask. Uh, Pakin the camel. <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, uh, I think we have a roll-in. We for do. That? Yeah, yeah, we got a clip of this. We got a clip of this, and then I'm going to come back with a question. Okay, this is what guys. Just in case, when you're all hosts in the future, when you want some tape played in the middle of a thing, what do we do? Roll tape. Roll tape, Sheldon. Roll it, Sheldon. <laughs> Sheldon, if you would. This is a story that started on January 24th in unprecedented fashion with the middle of the morning resignation of Patrick Brown. And here we are, all these weeks later, not many weeks by the political clock, all these weeks later, at 7.30 p.m., six hours after this convention began, and we still don't know who, going, who is going to be the leader of the PC party going forward. Amen. That was the crazy thing, right? They couldn't really announce a winner that night. Mm -hmm. And everybody went home not really knowing who'd won. So Christine Elliott, I believe, was challenging some of the numbers. There were issues with counting because they were using a new voting system. And all the, I guess most of the media had left and they didn't declare Doug Ford the winner until late at night, so three hours like later, 10 o'clock. And there were, hard, there were hardly any media there to Well, even it was cover. confusing because of course yeah. Elliott won more ridings and more votes. She got the popular but vote. But not more points. And this was a point okay. system, which is why I was confused. You're shaking your head. Yeah. I it was still very find confusing. that confusing. And didn't the hall have, didn't, wasn't the hall like double booked or something? Okay, so there was a fashion show <laughs> that was, later that day and they're, basically they came on stage and said, listen, this is booked, we gotta leave. We gotta Which leave. meant that the balloons above everyone <laughs> just hung in the net. <laughs> And we, tr we tried to find later with their investigative journalism what happened to those balloons. We do not know yet. <laughs> <laughs> the case of the we're still not sure balloons. Yes. Interesting. It All right. Nice. We have um, to have Patrick Brown starting off the new year when we come back in January. Uh, Nam uh, is doing that interview with Patrick. And he covered some of like that, the term, uh, tumultuous time that happened then. It's really great. So it's something to watch in the new year. Patrick January Brown, 2nd. Patrick Brown uh, watched that convention via us. Yeah. He watched the whole thing on our live stream. He was one of 93,000 people that watched it. Wow, no just kidding. To pump us up a little. Bit. That's fantastic. And originally it was only supposed to be like a, a few hours, yeah. right? Yeah, of course. How were you able to like stretch for all of that time? Because everything no, no, was done on the fly, right? Yeah, was I, don't, I can't believe you didn't, you didn't well, lose Well, I'll tell voice. you how. I'll tell you how. Great producers like you who brought guests constantly. And Jane the, Burke. The, the crew was fantastic. The yes. crew was there for I don't know how long. I mean, they might have had a 12-hour day that day and just had everything set up, and it all went tickety-boo. And it wasn't just to remind everybody. It wasn't on TV. It was live stream yes. on our social media platforms and so on. Was and it, and and it was you, a very cool way to do it. I remember shot? taking a magic marker on the back of scrunched up papers, <laughs> trying to let you know who the next person was and what their title was, and <laughs> holding it up to you as yeah. close as I could. So, but his voice but was shot. Your voice yeah. was yeah. shot, yeah. Your voice was shot yeah. the next day, yeah. but yeah. it was yeah. totally worth it. Yeah. Was there ever a moment where you were like, I've got nothing else to say? We've nope. been on for, no. Nope. <laughs> but remember, I don't have to say stuff so much as I just have to come up with questions. Right. So as long as, they're, as, long as the care and feeding of the host continued <laughs> in an editorial sense, I as was long fine. as the cheese and crackers kept coming. No, yeah. I didn't need cheese and crackers. <laughs> I needed guests, and we got lots of those. Okay, that's great. Now, okay, so Doug Ford eventually wins. Uh, there's an election campaign that he's thrown into almost immediately. Uh, we're, of course, hip deep, neck deep, covering the Ontario election campaign, which culminated with the June 7th vote. And you all had a bunch of different things that you did. I'm going to start with you. You danced with all the leaders. Yes, I did. Do you remember that? Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> what that was that for about? The late law youth town hall. Right. And we had invited all of the leaders to come and participate in front of a live audience. Um, and I just didn't want them, you know, because politicians are so scripted, right? They're so careful with how they carry themselves, what they say. And, and I just thought it would be fun to just to see who would do it and who, it, just to bring their guard down a little bit. They all did. I think Andrea Horvath was they there. Did. Mike Schreiner was there. Kathleen Wynne was yeah. there. Some of them looked at me like, are you serious? I thought <laughs> they Mike looked Schreiner at you. But Mike Schreiner got into it. He did. Yeah, he did. I, I thought they looked at you and said, are you Ellen DeGeneres? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a dancing thing. Yeah. Doug Ford didn't participate. No, he didn't. And uh, we did try to get him on. Um, I think some people thought that we did it without him or offering, but we did. Yeah, and we put the offer out. We and... put the offer out. Uh, it would have been great to have him there. Um, and the audience was great. There was a lot of uh, young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've reached that stage in my life where I refer to young people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they had a lot of great questions. They did. Uh, they were really engaged. Um, it was fun. Yeah. And you were right in the front audience. I was live tweeting You were thing. live tweeting it. Yeah. It was a little bit like nerve wracking because when I walked in, Come on, you're Steve Pagan, right? You do know you're Steve Pagan. I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, but you were sitting in the, in the front row, and this was my first, uh, first time that I covered an election. Huh. And when I saw you, I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta be on my game. But um, it was a good experience. And you were, and yeah. it turned out great. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, you did stuff on healthcare. 
during the election campaign. I did. Uh, you did housing during the election campaign. We had Erin Kelly, who was doing the... Um, Numbers. Polly. Yeah, yeah, she had this fantastic new algorithm that was able to forecast the results of like, darn near every riding correctly. Uh, you did mental health in the election. I did. You did transportation mm -hmm. during the election. Anyway, we had a lot of stuff going on. We did on. the north, too. We went all the way up to Sudbury. What does number 10 say on my sheet here? Uh, Harrison did <laughs> <laughs> on the road to Sudbury. The north yeah. and the election. <laughs> I was getting to you. I so was getting often to the you. north is forgotten, and that's one of the reasons you went up there. Does the north ever get forgetting on this program? Never. Not here. No, no. This is not, a, not on this program. What was the highlight of that for you? Just uh, getting a sense of some of the alienation that's felt yep. there. Getting yep. a sense of how important, uh, I guess, some of these traditional... Industries are, are still important in the communities, mining, uh, forestry, these sorts of things. And then looking at sort of the innovations that's taking place there, there's sort of startups there. I think uh, we met Roseanne Archibald that night. Yes. Who very shortly thereafter would become the head of Chiefs of Ontario. Yeah. It started that night. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, and great. you also had fun driving there, didn't you? Uh, yeah, the driving. <laughs> so I was doing a left-hand turn in Sudbury, and I don't know how this happened because we were in an unmarked TVO van. I know that sounds weird, uh, but <laughs> we so all Ontario plates van. are the same. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if I did the left-hand turn strange, like a city boy or what it was, but some guy honked at me from boy. behind, poked his head out the window and said, like, he's an expletive, but, uh, like, blank off, you <laughs> Toronto driver. So... <laughs> I, I anyway, kind of know the full story. Go, you, was, you sped up to get to a red light. <laughs> There's different accounts. Of <laughs> Honorable anyway, people will disagree. Other than that, we were very, we were very much welcomed. Yeah. It was a great experience. <laughs> Good. And of course, it all culminated with election night, and uh, we may have a little excerpt of uh, some of the work you folks did on election night, Sheldon, if you please. Okay, wow. this is very irregular, I gotta That's say. That's an incredible welcome, I thank you. And what are we supposed to do Hazel, here? With, I mean, protocol thank says you, you let the outgoing yeah. premier yeah. speak first yeah. before the winner speaks. Thank you so much, my friends. What a response. This is incredible. Well, every election night broadcast had a really awful decision to have to make at that hour, because as I suggested, protocol dictates that the losing premier speaks first, mm -hmm. and then the incoming premier speaks after that. For whatever reason, uh, that tradition was not upheld on election night, and incoming premier Ford decided to speak at the same time as Kathleen Wynne was. And I remember going to the news conference a couple of days later, asking Kathleen Wynne how that happened, and she had a long pause before answering, saying, well, let's just say signals got crossed. And as a result of that, we had our editor basically pulling his hair out, running from one room to the next, scrambling frantically to try and tape her speech and then find a good portion of, that we could sort of shoot down here and then put on air. So it was a whole yeah. challenge, but we got through Patricia, one of the other producers also yeah, helped. She helped out. Pat Patricia yeah. Kozicka, yeah. yeah. We, did, we did eventually get Wynn's concession speech on the air, but it came on much later uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, and then we got a new government, and we're off to the races covering a lot of the new issues, and as uh, I don't think uh, will come as a surprise to anybody, um, this government hit the ground running. They went hard, they went fast, and one of the first things they did, and therefore one of the first things you produced, was the bill to reduce the size of Toronto City Council. Yeah, the notwithstanding clause was invoked in order to shrink Toronto Council before the election. Would have been invoked. They didn't yeah, actually we, right, do it, right, but right, the threat they, was there to use yes. it. Yes. And it caused yeah. a giant kerfuffle in terms of, you know, coverage and people, politicos were very interested and some people were very upset. And I took a week to produce a panel on that that kept evolving. And um, one of the things that I find is stressful about that type of situation is you're really, really uh, cognizant of the fact that you need for it to be completely balanced. And you know that the people who are interested in this topic are very interested, and they are often at Queen's Park. So, mm -hmm. um, And you had all the chairs full here, I think, right? Yeah, six, six people. David, mm -hmm. oh, no, David Miller I had booked, and then he ended up having to drop out. The former Toronto mayor. Uh, yes, yeah. the fr Toronto former mayor. And I, in, I replaced him with Patricia Wood, who is a political science mm -hmm. professor at York University. Marie Boutriani, Karen Stintz, Andrew Coyne, Deb Hutton, and Mark Tui. Tui. 
That seems pretty balanced to me. Yes, it was. And it evolved into, a, I think, a really good discussion. Hmm. You then, uh, with me, produced a piece on the ex-MPPs who decided to run again municipally. Yeah. And uh, many of them won. Mm -hmm. And we sort of walked down memory lane about uh, what would you have done differently and how's your life going to change now that you've been out of politics for three months and right back in. Yeah, I, I, I'm blanking on who said it, but I think one of the MPPs said uh, she, I think she was counting on, on uh, losing that night. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think she was expecting to lose as maybe as Badly. That was Dipika Damala right, yeah, from yeah, Mississauga. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I mean, I appreciate all of them for coming on and talking about uh, that night because it couldn't have been easy. And I mean, I guess the assumption would be that if you go from uh, provincial politics to like municipal, that could be seen as like maybe a step down. But I don't think any of them uh, took it that way. I think they were no. all pretty happy to be uh, in these new roles. So. And it was also an indication that, that even though they had lost, it was not necessarily personal, right? Right, yeah. Provincial politics is a lot more about party and platform and leader and a lot less about the individual member. And when they won their seats municipally, they were able to sort of, you know, yeah. come back. Exactly. Kara, you did something on, uh, this was a really big story the first week back, a little less so now, but I suspect it'll come back, sex ed and math curriculum. That was a big deal. Yeah, um, definitely they'll be coming back in, in the news um, as they're revamping it. But just learning a lot about the way they've changed, the, the way they teach math, is it's interesting that there's so much debate about do we go back to the way that people would memorize things and the more traditional way of learning math versus the discovery math that apparently is more like, I think you mix it in with other parts of the curriculum. Um, and I didn't realize how controversial that was. So that, that was very quickly something that we decided to cover. What's seven times six? Uh, 42. Well done. Oh, that was well me. Done. That wasn't that was, me. That you know was what? Totally she didn't mean. even use her fingers. Here's though. the thing. Here's the thing. If she hadn't gotten it right, we would have edited it out. Nobody would have known. <laughs> but she got it right, and so she was Maybe able to show what a super we, we would have all known. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell okay, them that do. we, we don't edit it. We're, we're peeling the curtain back here. A few <laughs> secrets. A few secrets. Namshine. Yes. You did the third summer of the Agenda in the Summer this mm -hmm. past summer. Mm -hmm. I said summer three times in that sentence. <laughs> um, let's show the clip first, then we can talk about uh, some of what you thought were some of the more memorable moments of okay. that, shall we? Okay, Sheldon, if you would. I'm thinking that, you know, um, that you sometimes it is, it's very easy to think that your voice doesn't matter. Um, but for you to be in a position where you are making life better for so many other seniors, what does it mean for you to be part of this and to see the change that's happening that you've made, that you've been a part of? Well, it's certainly changed me uh, from the time I started the CARP chapter to now, which is about nine years ago, and the focus. And I really think we need to put the different age groups together, not separate them. I think with um, people moving out to the suburbs. It did, it got away from families. Now there's the next door teenager babysitting instead of grandma. Mm -hmm. I just think we need to bring some of those mixtures back together because we can all help one another. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. What'd you love about that? Um, I, well, because in the summer, I guess we're peeling the curtain back a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. When we do the summer, we pre-tape a lot of this stuff. Um, and from the first two summers that I did, um, we didn't really have that much policy in the show. And I know a lot of people tune into the agenda, mostly for, for the policy, right? So this summer, this past summer, we did something called Municipal Mondays, where we looked at municipal issues and uh, tried to uh, share with the audience some of the things that we might not know about what happens in municipal at the local level. And uh, so Barry uh, did this great thing where they uh, collaborated with CARP um, to make the city more age-friendly. And they actually won an award in, uh, in March uh, for age-friendly community. Um, hmm. It was an, the inaugural award, but they won it this past year. Um, and doing little things like making uh, crosswalks a bit longer. Uh, if you're a senior, that means you don't have to rush across and in the process you might fall. But I thought it was really great that Gwen got involved and that uh, the mayor of Barrie, Jeff Lehman, uh, collaborated with her and her group. Um, because it's like, you know, at every stage of your life, you're like, oh, am I doing enough? I'm not doing enough. Or you might think that your voice doesn't matter. Or when you get to a certain age, you're like, oh, I have nothing to contribute. I have nothing uh, more to give. But uh, she really played a role in making the city uh, better for the seniors in Barrie. Um, not just for now, but in f moving down in the future. And one of the things that they do that I really, really love in Barrie, they have this um, 
programming uh, co-housing. Remember, like, the Golden Girls, they all live together, <laughs> yeah. and, you know? I mean, I would love that. I would love to live with, like, I would. If they had, like, a program for grandparents, I would love that. I just think that, you know, we live in an age where we're more connected uh, technically, like, technologically, uh, over, like, social media and stuff. Yeah. But uh, we just feel to be so far apart, and mm -hmm. people um, are living a lonely life. And um, I think what Barry's done is so incredible, and hopefully other cities uh, in Ontario We'll look to what they're doing and try to replicate it. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I will confess to a bias here. My favorite interview of yours over the summer was with Tom Wilson, mm -hmm. who, like me, is from Hamilton. Right. We have the same birthday. Uh, I've known him a long time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of the, the story. What a life, right? And, uh, like, w we've had such different lives. I had a normal middle-class life on the mountain in Hamilton, me, and mm -hmm. he's had this absolutely shocking and now, like, amazing revelation very late in his life. Anyway. Um, Tom Wilson, get his book. You really got to read his book. And it's the voice, fantastic. right? Oh, boy. His voice is incredible. Think how far I could have gone in television <laughs> if I had his voice. <laughs> Anyways. You've done okay. You've done, done okay, okay You've but done all right. if I had his pipes, oh, my goodness. Uh, next on our list here, Waterloo Global Science Initiative. Eric, you headed up our Sustainable Development Bureau. Mm -hmm. and, well, it's uh, not a bureau, but... Yeah, you're right. It's not really a bureau. <laughs> you're just the guy. But that yeah. sounds good. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. So we've had an ongoing partnership with uh, WGSI, which we do not call WIGSI. We need to remember that. Heaven uh, forfend. So WGSI does a summit. We've done, in the past, the future of energy. Uh, we've done energy poverty there. Uh, last year, it was the sustainable development goals. And every year, WGSI does something that's really cool, where they bring all these different thinkers from different disciplines that are normally siloed on one major topic. So this year it was the Sustainable Development Goals. They smash them in a room together and they try to come up with something new. So conferences normally, it's someone comes on stage, says their, says their piece and leaves. This, they put people together in a room and they try to come up with stuff. So we did the Sustainable Development Goals this year. There are 17 of them. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think it was a good discussion because this stuff is, should be really inspirational. I mean, these 17 goals, People from national governments and provincial and municipal are working together to try to make the world a better place With to live luck, in. They're going to change the world, exactly. But what can happen is the people that kind of are in this bubble, it can get really jargony. Mm -hmm. Like, let's leverage synergy across multiple levels of governance to help hit these targets. Like, that doesn't <laughs> really inspire. So I think we what were able to. <laughs> exactly. I think we were able to kind of uh, get past the jargon a little mm -hmm. bit. Okay, that was the sublime. Shall we now go to the ridiculous? Can I say one more thing about that, though? What, you know what they're telling me in my ear? This is, now, this is what you producers tell me right. when I let this thing get out of control. And you say, come on, we're running out of time. Get yeah. moving. And I got a producer in my ear saying, we're running out of time. Get okay. moving. From the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, my favorite interview uh, we aired two days ago. Here we go. Mr. Director. Whether or not a group of... A group of millionaires succeed at their hockey games each week. It's not important. And the role you play in them winning that game. Is, is like, you know, that, that's the, let's be honest. What, <laughs> what, what, what did I contribute? You know, but it is, it is everything, too. Mm -hmm. If you were to use only, like, utilitarian uh, kind of criteria to dictate what's important in a life, well, I think you'd have a, a really boring life with no sort of love in it. Stuff's as real as we want it to be, you know, and, and there, there's a certain sort of, you, what, one could make an argument that, um, what, one could make an argument that all politics is play acting as well and that it's all bread and circus, that all of it is bread and circus. <laughs> um, however, I like bread and I like the circus sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his provocatively wearing that Habs hat, he was a delightful guest. <laughs> and the book was, we all know Jay is funny. Mm -hmm. We all know him as uh, uh, the director of Goon, but this book was deep. This was. book was insightful. Mm -hmm. There is something, I'm a diehard Leafs fan, and this book was about the Habs, but it made me feel closer to the Leafs. There would, is this very weird... somebody who <laughs> doesn't like hockey like the book? Yes, and the reason is... You promise? I no, they would. <laughs> <laughs> they would. The reason is, is that I've, I analyze most things in my life, but my love for the Leafs was, this, this, was like this orb of feeling I've never really questioned, and his book sort of peels that back. And it's absurd to be a, 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 a diehard sports fan. Of course it is. It makes no sense at all. But underpinning <laughs> the whole story was a, a very poignant father-son relationship, which is uh, throughout the story, and it's very, very touching. And his father had a very hard life, and 
was not present in much of Jay's life. So it, it's, it's a great read for all those reasons. And we did a little trivia at the end, too. Oh, let's not go into that. <laughs> I think I lost. Um, what's the next thing we're going to do here? Uh, Kara, big story this year about the legalization of pot uh, all over the country, but of course our interest would be here in the province. And you also did a story uh, on our relationship with booze to get us into the swing of that. Let's take a look at that one. Sheldon, go. Oh, I'm not supposed to say I that. do think that sobriety as a lifestyle is becoming trendier. So I do think that while we, you know, as a, as a society, drinking heavily is still often the norm, especially if you go out to a bar or restaurant. Like if I go to a bar or restaurant, I'm often asked multiple times in the evening whether I'm you know, going to have a drink. And that is more normal than saying, oh, and I'm just drinking water. Asked by whom? Uh, the servers or anybody there, the guests, people at the table, anybody really. They're determined to put alcohol yeah. in. Yeah, that just seems to be the way. Um, however, I do think, you know, when we're, when we're talking about millennials, um, I, I do think that not drinking, abstaining is becoming more socially acceptable. Hmm. Okay, you're a millennial, is that true? I think so. I think there's a lot of people who don't drink, but it still is, that is still part of our culture that we drink with everything. There was a quote we had in there where they talked about how you miss part of the story of our culture. If you don't, if you don't drink at a, like a wedding, you toast, like every, we mark every significant event with alcohol. And I think that's still there, even though there is more acceptance. I noticed that like, um, like, I decided to have like a few, to take a few weeks off of drinking around the holidays last year. And I kept finding like, I found the exact same experience that she had where people were like, why? And I'm like, I just don't want to drink tonight. Or I'd just be like, oh, I'm not feeling well. Like, I feel like I have to make up a reason. Mm. Otherwise, people are like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I just, we have a lot of holiday parties. Like, let's just, what's the problem with Take not, a break. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't actually need to explain yourself why you And it was interesting because to. it was um, with legalization of cannabis. It's, we're adding something into this. And as people talk about uh, cannabis, it seems like there is a lot more acceptance that those, that actually can may be less harmful to people than mm. alcohol. So I wonder if we're, if we're going to have to have that question in our in our society about do we want to be drinking as much as we do and if we're adding this other substance uh, mix them together becomes way worse so I think I think it's something we need to reevaluate right yeah, now we'll keep covering that we'll keep an eye on that Meredith you did something called the science of the sexes let's show a clip of that and then we'll come back and chat Sheldon on the grandmother hypothesis um, it's mainly women that have done the work not just women but mainly women and so I was just fascinated by the idea that within science, on this same topic, you can have two different theories, very different, and that the sex of the researcher seemed to almost influence what they were saying to some extent. Maybe it had not bearing on what they were saying, um, which is not what you expect science to do. Mm -hmm. You think it's objective, it's factual, it doesn't matter if you're black or white or male or female. It shouldn't make any difference. But apparently it does. But it does. And um, so from that, I started looking to you know, all the different ways in which science has approached the topic of women's minds and bodies. And um, it's a scientific battleground. Hmm. Why did you want to do that topic? Um, well, I, I found this book written by Angela Sani, who's a science journalist with a background in engineering. And she's kind of a one of a kind. And uh, it was the most interesting book I've read in the last year, but it is my favorite interview of all time. Hmm. She is incredibly articulate. I learned a lot. And after that aired, um, a physicist in the UK found her book so significant, particularly for women in science, that she started a crowdfunding campaign that got the book in every uh, public school library in the UK. And now there are people doing that here in Canada. They've started a GoFundMe campaign. They have a long way to go in terms of raising enough money. But I think it's a, an incredibly important uh, book to read if you're a parent of a daughter and you want to open your mind to science and some of the biases that are inherent in science. Angela Saini, S-A-I-N-I. -I. Mm -hmm. Go look for the book. OK, we got enough time to do one more. We're going to turn to the Dean of the Investigative Journalists in the United <laughs> States of America today. Here's Cy Hirsch. Go ahead, Sheldon, roll it. If you go to the memorial there, I, have, I did, I didn't want to. But, you know, uh, after 30 years, um, you know, living off Mila was a big thing for me. You know, I have, mm. what do I have? A wife, children, dog, cat, the gerbil, you know, all the pets. Mm. Everybody wanted to go back to where I first cut my teeth. Mm -hmm. So we went back about four years ago, and for me, all of us, went back to Mila. It was very moving. I couldn't stop crying. I still can't think about it. 
because I was in the Army. How do you do that? This is the guy who broke the story of the My Lai Massacre 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he was an incredible, like, talker. I mean, he could just tell you, like, any story from, the, like, the last 50 years, and it's automatically just fascinating. And it's really interesting to meet someone who's been a part of uh, history, in a way. I mean, he's reported on, like, events like My Lai, but also the Abu Ghraib mass um, scandal. Yep. Um, and it's just incredible, yeah, to, like, be in someone's presence who's been, th like, reporting on this stuff for so long that you've read about, uh, but you want to know kind of, like, the man or the person behind uh, you know, how we learned about these stories. Uh, and I just thought that that's that moment where he, he kind of got choked up talking about the Milai massacre, uh, you know, 50 years later, I was really moving. It was. I want to thank everybody for coming on this set and reminiscing about 2018. We have to stop this now because we have to get back to work and start working on 2019. <laughs> Best of the season to you all, and Happy New Year as well. Happy See you in 2019. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.